Welcome everyone. Hi, I'm Kate. Thank you so much for attending this latest installment of the iMotions webinar series. Uh, I'm so excited for our content today. It's going to be a really great fireside chat type conversational style with Jess and Coy, who are our resident experts on EMG and ECG. Um, so we'll get started in just a minute, but I just wanted to say that uh, our recording of this webinar will be sent out in 24 hours to anyone who's attending now, but also people who have registered and couldn't attend. Or if you need to duck out early, no problem, you will be able to receive the webinar in your inbox tomorrow in about 24 hours. So no worries there. And uh, we also have a question box here in the chat that you can see on your screen. So feel free to drop your questions into there and uh, we're gonna be answering them over the course of the hour. As this is more conversational, we're gonna try to aggregate the questions when they're appropriate and then we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. So just uh, as your questions come in, just put them in and I will be pulling them through for Jess and Coy. And on that note, I'm gonna turn my camera off and I'm gonna introduce, let or Jess and Coy introduce themselves. So thanks so much guys, take it away. Awesome, thank you, Kate. Um, so again, like Kate said, welcome to today's webinar. I'm super excited to jump back on the webinar train here and I'm really excited to do with my colleague, Koi. Uh, so a little bit about our backgrounds. Um, I'm a senior product specialist at iMotions and my background is in neuroscience, um, but with a specific focus on rehabilitation and movement science. So my PhD was actually on the muscle activity of movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease, which is why I'm extra excited today to talk about a sensor that is near and dear to my heart, EMG, um, looking at muscle activity. Uh, and again, I'm super thrilled to present with my colleague, Koi. I'll let him introduce himself. Awesome, hello everyone. So my name is Koi Bo. I'm the technical client consultant here at iMotions, where I help, uh, help a lot of clients with customized solutions, as well as anything you need uh, when it comes to iMotions as a software. Uh, my PhD is in cognitive neuroscience, where I studied how attention affects decision-making. I focus a lot on EEG, eye tracking, and computational models, but I've used a wide variety of uh, biosensors, including ECG, in, in my work, especially before my PhD, doing uh, consumer behavior. Awesome. So uh, first off, I know we have a couple of people in the audience that are probably new to iMotion, so I want to go to give a quick recap as to what exactly we do and why we're here today. So here at iMotions, we um, are purveyors of biosensor technology, and we really believe in the use of biological signals to um, give us insights into human behavior. And typically when researchers in academia or in industry want to assess human behavior, they typically rely on things like self-report, questionnaires, indexes, more traditional methods. And while these methods are really established, they're not entirely perfect, um, mainly because we're articulating what it is that we feel. And we have to mitigate things like our own internal biases, our attitudes, um, our ability to recall specific events, even the emotional lexicon that we have, the words that we use to describe what we're feeling can limit the kind of information that we can articulate about our internal state. So at iMotions, we're huge believers in the use of biosensor technology. Uh, so things like eye tracking, heart rate, facial expressions, and so on, um, to really augment how we can look at human behavior. And, and we don't ever propose that we replace these more conventional methods like self-report and survey, but we want to extend these traditional methods with new techniques for additive insight. So what biosensor technologies give you is the physio physiological reaction of somebody during an exposure to a stimulus right in the moment, bypassing all of these other cognitive um, traps like biases and so forth. Um, so we want to extend that data set and believe that the two work really well together to assess human behavior. So iMotions as a company, um, we are first and foremost a software company. We provide a software platform that integrates and synchronizes all of these biosensor inputs into a single place. Uh, we also are um, resellers of the biosensors and hardware. So we partner very strongly with all of the third party uh, leading hardware vendors that we integrate. Um, and then third, which is really a big point of pride for us is our support and services. So if you want to get into the use of neuroscience and biosensor tools, but you don't have the experience for it, we're happy to come in and really walk you through the entire process of getting you trained, telling you what these are about. Um, and the webinar series that you're seeing now is, uh, is a huge part of that too. 
Awesome. So today, Jess and I have put together a series of fireside chats. Uh, so uh, she and I will be conversing about different things, EMG and ECG, uh, hopefully to, uh, to have different engagement with the audience out there. Uh, so first off, we will talk about what is EMG and ECG. And then we'll have a series of, you know, let's talk. The first will be let's talk applications, uh, let's talk alternatives, and let's talk technical. We're both PhDs. We can't let you leave without talking some technical aspects about ECG and EMG. Um, but throughout all of these, let's talk uh, fire chats, uh, you know, fireside chats. We'll also throw in different applications as well. So cool. Shall we get started, Jess? With our first uh, fireside chat. One second, I think my audio just cut out here. Um, no Koi, can you say something? There we go. Okay, yeah. we're back on. Hear me? <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Cool. So let's start with our first fireside chat, and let's 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 talk EMG and ECG. When what it is? Awesome. So. Again, like I said, EMG is near and dear to my heart. And basically what electromyography gives you is the um, a recording of the electrical activity of muscle tissue. And if we wanna really understand this, we wanna dive a little bit into the underlying physiology here. Um, so when you want to generate any sort of movement, that movement comes from the brain, goes down to the spinal cord and out to the muscles through specialized neurons called motor neurons. A motor unit consists of a motor neuron and the muscle fibers that it innervates. And a single muscle can have multiple bundles of uh, muscle fibers that are innervated by these, by these units. When a motor neuron sends action potentials to the muscle fibers, um, each of these muscle fibers generates their own action potentials, which are shown here as individual myoelectric signals. So all of this to say within a muscle, you have multiple bundles of these motor units, each generating their own signal. What you get then, if you take an electrode and you put it on the surface of the skin to record what's going on underneath, what you're seeing is the summation of all of those different myoelectric signals into a single global uh, EMG signal. There we go. So this is what you see when you are recording from EMG. And for those who are familiar with EEG, this is the exact same premise. So with EEG, when you're measuring signals from the surface of the scalp, you have individual neurons in the brain that are firing at their own pace, but what EEG is recording is the summation of all of that neural activity from the scalp. It's the exact same thing in EMG, just within a different context. So in the end, what you're seeing is what the muscles are doing. And in terms of the different ways we can record EMG, there's many different electrode setups you can use. Um, Typically what you're gonna see are these paired or bipolar electrode setup, which is what you see in this image here. Paired or bipolar means that for each muscle, you have two electrodes. So with this uh, setup here with a shimmer device, we're recording from two muscles simultaneously. We have this one, the first dorsal interosseous in the finger, which does this motion here. Um, and then we have another one, the brachial radialis, which is an arm flexor, also known as your beer holding muscle. So this is, would be a typical setup for the forearm. But there's many other setups as well. There are single electrode setups you can use, or you can do what I did during my research, which is use fine wire electrodes, which is actually inserting electrodes into the muscles themselves, which is pretty metal once you think about it. But your most common setup would be your um, paired or bipolar electrode setup. This is basically what the raw signal would look like. Um, this is measured in millivolts because we're looking at voltage. So when there's no activity in the muscle, you have this flat straight line. But once you contract the muscle, you see this burst of voltage here, um, which you can quantify in multiple ways. You can look at the latency. So when it occurs, you can um, run some transformations to look at the overall amplitude, uh, which would correspond with the strength of that contraction. You can also compare across multiple muscles to see which are more active than others for a given movement. It's actually really cool that you opened up with EMG because if you think about it, the heart itself, it's just a bunch of cardiac muscles, right? So jumping right into ECG, we have a really nice uh, sort of segue here to say that ECG or electrocardiography is just a measurement of the electrical activity in the heart that causes contraction and relaxation of cardiac muscle. So you see a little GIF here that, that shows that electrical propagation through the heart and how the heart contracts and relaxes. For ECG, we also collect the signal on top of the skin. Uh, most commonly, or where you get the most uh, strongest signal is actually put, placing electrodes on the chest. And uh, for ECG, we have to do it in a specific manner in order to capture that electrical activity of the heart. 
So you see that underneath the gif here of the heart beating, there's a little bit of a wave uh, showing the different parts of the electrical activity when the heart is contracting and relaxing. So this is the only anatomy aspect that I will give you guys in this uh, conversation, this fireside chat. But what, what is that electrical impulse and, and what are the different um, you know, uh, component of it? So you see that there are three broad components, the P wave, the QRX complex, and the T wave. Uh, so with the P wave, that's when the, the, the electrical signal starts, QRX complex is depolarization and then the contraction of the heart to pump out the blood. And then you have the uh, heart relaxing, uh, getting ready for the next part. So we all know that ECG gives us heart rate. And when we're talking about heart rate, we're talking about this idea of the frequency of these impulse cycle within a minute or beats per minute. So you see this example here in the green where I have different, uh, you know, full cycle of the cardiac electrical activity. And when we count the end of the minute, there's your heart rate. So unlike the muscles that Jess tends to uh, look at with EMG, the heart muscle or a cardiac muscle cannot be controlled voluntarily. So with uh, the heart, uh, heart rate is controlled by autonomic or involuntary nervous system, where this actually is a really nice way to uh, use to pair up with uh, behavioral research. Because in this instance, you cannot control what your heart rate is doing. So collecting heart rate will give you this uh, uh, window into a subconscious response from your participants when they are participating in your research. So the way that it works here is with the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system or the fight or flight system increases the heart rate and the parasympathetic nervous system or the rest and digest system as we all know it will decrease the heart rate. So Corey, I have a quick question if we can go back to that yeah. earlier slide. So we're talking about sympathetic versus parasympathetic input and another popular sensor that we work with is GSR, galvanic skin response as we know. Yes. And the reason why GSR is so popular is because it's an indicator of arousal, which comes from the sympathetic system. So yep. a question that I commonly get asked is, can GSR be considered the same or interchangeable with heart rate as a measure? I would not say they, they are the same or interchangeable, but I would say that they're complementary to each other in a sense. Um, in, in one instance, uh, believe it or not, GSR is rather a quicker reaction when you're, when you're measuring sort of subconscious responses than, than waiting for your heart rate to change uh, you know, based on events. Um, and the other aspect is when you're measuring uh, you know, ECG data, depending on how you analyze it, you can technically get at both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic control to give you different aspects of uh, you know, cognition Whereas with GSR, you're only capturing that one aspect of the fight or flight system, uh, or in this case, high or low arousal. That makes a lot of sense. I think since heart rate is one of those that we're all intimately familiar with, you know, it's uh, it's yeah. hard to sort of bring in GSR as like, oh, the, here's another sensor because it's not so well known. Um, but I think mm -hmm. you make a really good point on the differences between the different kinds of analyses, and we'll get into that a little bit more further down uh, the webinar. Yep. So, so how do you measure EMG, Jess? Yeah, so uh, having gone through the premise, let's go through some of the tech that's available. So um, one of the most popular sensors that we sell is the Shimmer device, and you know this from uh, measuring GSR. So the Shimmer GSR is, is very popular here, um, but Shimmer also sells an EXG variant that measures EMG. So with uh, these five extra ports, the Shimmer has the capacity to record from two muscles simultaneously, um, which is really great. Uh, and again, the same benefits of Shimmer apply. It's Bluetooth. Uh, you can sort of strap it to whatever limb you're using. There's built-in accelerometers as well um, if you want that uh, sort of kinesiological data on top of that. Uh, and the sampling rate can go up to 1,000 hertz, which is suitable for EMG. Awesome. And I can think I can take the same sensor and measure uh, ECG. So with the same shimmer device, you can switch it to ECG mode. That gives you um, the ability to record at five different electrode sites on the chest. Uh, so when I was saying that with ECG, you have to measure the heart electrical signal by placing the electrodes sort of st strategically on the chest. Well, using these uh, different ports, you can actually create what's called the Eindhoven triangle, you know, uh, encompassing the heart. So then given that encompassing, we can actually capture the electrical signal that's being uh, propagated. 
So if you're going to use the full setup, you can use all five channels. And these are some placement sites here that corresponds uh, with the color on the, the ports themselves. But what we normally see or an easier setup is just using two ports uh, and then one of them to act as a, a variable um, placement on, on the chest there. So it's actually pretty flexible hardware. Um, which is kind of cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one other piece of hardware that you can record EMG from is the Biopack, and the Biopack has a sterling reputation amongst um, amongst electro uh, amongst physiologists uh, and those in movement science. Um, their data quality is really good, uh, and the way it would work is you would have your Biopack MP160, and then they have many different modules for different modalities you would want, but you can basically sort of aggregate different modalities based on what it is you're interested in. So for EMG specifically, they have two options. The first is their EMG 100C, which is wired, but then they also have the Bionomatics uh, wireless EMG preamp for more dynamic setups. So again, this is a bipolar setup. You can record either one or two muscles at a time, um, and it's just a really great piece of equipment to work with. And you can extend your MP150 or 160 with another module to do ECG. So again, uh, with Biopack, there's a wired, or in this case, I like to call it the tethered solution, because your participant will be connected to this actual desktop unit to get at uh, the heart rate by connecting it to these two ports shown on screen. Uh, the other aspect is using the Bionomatics, which I would consider the wearable solution. You can actually wear the amplifier on the participant and using the cables here, you can also grab uh, ECG signal that way. So why don't we jump into some actual applications and you know, see how these methodologies work. Yeah, let's get excited about some stuff. So yeah. the first application I wanna talk about is virtual reality. But that's sort, of, that's sort of the hook though, because it sort of goes beyond virtual reality. I, I wanna talk about EMG within the context of any scenario where traditional facial expression analysis is not possible. So as you know, facial expressions are a big deal at iMotions. We have the Aftex engine that's really popular, um, but there are several scenarios in which Aftex can't be used. Um, so VR and AR headsets are one big example um, because you have a big headset occluding the face. Um, eye tracking glasses can also be problematic and get in the way of picking up the face. So that's a setup that we conventionally advise don't use facial expressions with. And as well, any use cases where people are moving around within a given space make it really hard to use that webcam-based facial expression uh, measure. So architecture is a use case if people are moving around within a house, simulation and training. Uh, we see this a lot in the defense uh, space where people have simulators within um, a cockpit or within a sort of a ship interface, any usability that happens within a live environment or even in-store studies as people are navigating within a space, um, it's impossible to really get a good fix on their camera the entire time they're there. So um, facial expressions conventionally can't be used in these scenarios, but facial EMG can help fill that gap um, and actually do more than that. So. The great thing about EMG is that any muscle that is close to the skin can be recorded. So you can basically pick and choose which muscles you wanna look at based on what your research question is. And the reason why I bring up VR and all these other scenarios is that facial EMG is a really popular application for um, EMG in general. And we have an example here in the image on the left. So Conventionally, when we use facial EMG, people tend to look at two specific muscles. The first is the corrugator supercilii, which is actually uh, runs along the eyebrow and is responsible for brow furrow. And then we have zygomaticus major, um, which goes from the corner of the mouth up to the zygomatic arch here. And this is responsible for pulling your lips up and back in a smile. These two measures corresponding to smile and brow furrow respectively are really popular options for facial EMG because it gives you that really easy positive negative valence. As a fun piece of trivia, zygomaticus major, um, there's a mutation of it where it actually is bifurcated. So you have major and minor zygomaticus and that's for people who have dimples. Did you know that, Koi? Uh, I did not know that. What, so I don't have the mutation? Nope, but I do. <laughs> So that's a fun piece of trivia. Um, 
But beyond facial EMG, there is uh, there are many other muscles that can be recorded from. A personal favorite for me is the trapezius muscle, and that's that big meaty muscle here on the shoulders, because that's often used in ergonomics and human factors as an indicator of stress. So if you're working at a desk and you end up having that creep in your shoulders, that's your trapezius at work. It also works really well for startle responses, so you end up doing that when you're scared by something. We'll see an application for that in a little bit. One question, Jess, do you have a rule of thumb on how you should place uh, some of these electrodes to measure the, the muscle activity? Yes, absolutely. So general placement for muscles is you want to go in the direction of the muscle fibers. So every muscle will have a beginning and an end where the tendons are. Um, and so for corrugator, for example, that muscle goes along the edge of the eyebrow and for zygomaticus, it goes along this direction here. You don't want to, for a bipolar setup, you don't want them to be perpendicular. You want them to be in line with the fibers. So if you're looking for a specific muscle, don't be afraid to like refer to an anatomy text just to see where is the start and end of the muscle to be able to put them in the right place. Beyond that, um, your electrodes should not be greater than two centimeters apart. Um, they should be fairly close together. The farther away your electrodes are, you run the risk of crosstalk from other muscles nearby, potentially contaminating your signal. So having two electrodes close together um, and then also in the direction of the muscle fibers, um, that would be typically the most important points. Makes a lot of sense, thank you. So I have a sample use case done in VR. This was one of my first projects here at iMotions I had a ton of fun with. So um, The Bellows is a VR horror game designed to play like an interactive movie. So people navigate through this haunted house. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to quantify the jump scares in the game to see, can I use EMG to determine which of these has the highest scare? Um, so of course, facial expression analysis can't be done due to the VR headset in the face. So I use EMG in two places, the uh, corrugator, just to get an overall sense of negative valence in the game, but then also trapezius, again, to measure that startle response. So here's me going through the experience. Uh, so I'm going through this haunted house here and there's gonna be a point where the furniture is going to levitate and then run into, yeah, there's my startle right there. Um, it was a very creepy game. Uh, so what I did was there were four different jump scares uh, that I wanted to quantify in the game. What I did is I measured EMG from these areas, uh, ran some filtering and cleaning, which we'll get into and was able to quantify the max average activity across all my participants. So these are the results for Corrugator. We ran five participants. Um, and there's a lot of variability between respondents, but in general, there didn't appear to be much of a difference across the different scares. People, in terms of negative valence, people were about the same either way and didn't differ much from one another. However, if we go to the trapezius data, this is where some specific uh, jump scares really uh, shine. So there's a loud knock that happens that startles you. The furniture that you saw uh, in that movie of like me doing this when the furniture moved, those elicited the strongest responses from people. And there's also a creepy man that shows up and a rat that sort of surprises you as you're going down a hallway and these didn't perform so well. So this is a, a great example of being able to use EMG to delineate between different experiences and to be able to compare um, a specific behavior in different settings. Yeah, this sounds like a great Halloween game. We really need to get this going <laughs> again. Oh man, Halloween demos are the best. <laughs> So I also have uh, a use case here uh, to stick with the theme, also another VR use case. Uh, to, to give a context as to why this use case might be cool um, for folks out there is, when I was doing a lot of consumer behavior research, um, one of the questions that I had was, you can always do research in the lab. Um, and in this case, when you use VR, you can create a great simulation, right? So you can actually create that environment, that visual perspective but can you really bring that experience to that simulation? So in this case, if you're using VR to, to look at a roller coaster ride, you're sitting there in that seat. Do you get that same experience that you would get if you were at the theme park, you know, actually going on a roller coaster, which I truly, truly miss because I never had a chance to do so this, this summer. So this is my way to relive some of that experience. So here we have a game called No Limits uh, to Roller Coaster Simulation. What we do here is the question is, can we simulate the roller coaster experience at home? Do we feel the same excitement as I mentioned? And here I'm going to use ECG to try to capture that excitement, that physiological response 
that you get when you ride a roller coaster, right? That mix of anxiety yet excitement as you're going down that drop. One thing to know with ECG um, is that your heart rate, when you're measuring heart rate with ECG, it's under involuntary control by the autonomic nervous system. So there are many environmental as well as individual factors that can influence it. So when that uh, comes into play, what you want to do with this type of research is actually have a comparative scenario. So similar to like an A-B uh, contrast where you have everything that's controlled for just for one sort of tweak, and that's the condition that you want to test. So in this case, because I want to see if the experience of riding a roller coaster at home uh, using VR simulation deliver that same, same emotion, I'm going to compare it with just watching the, the ride on the desktop, right? So if you were playing this game on a computer screen. So those are going to be my two uh, uh, scenario. In this case, it should be A and B. I uh, apologize for that. A is the desktop experience. B is the VR experience. So I'm going to show you a little bit of a clip about what this roller coaster ride was like. And this actually is a clip of that you know, impending drop. Usually, this first drop of roller coaster is always uh, you know, nerve wracking until you, you get all that adrenaline building and just like, I want more. Uh, so. Jess, I don't know I'll if you like roller coasters. I don't want more. <laughs> I'm yeah. getting stressed out watching this. So yeah, so here we're gonna get to the drop real soon, and it will drop right about here. So, that's so imagine, the top. <laughs> yeah, imagine I'm watching this on the computer screen. The computer screen is not gonna take up my entire visual field, so I'm still okay with it. But imagine wearing this on a VR headset where it's straight in your face and you can actually feel that. So here we want to see did that make a difference right so the first analysis that i'm doing here is just capturing uh you know pure heart rate so how many beats per minute are we getting from the ecg data ecg data between the desktop condition and the vr condition the cool thing that you see here is that between the two condition overall coaster riding you get higher heart rate uh and during that big drop you also get higher heart rate uh in in the vr uh, setting so you know the participants that are doing this are actually getting excited and having an emotional uh, response to, to that experience. But what happens though, if you have a study in which heart rate comes out to be the same, you don't have any differences there, but then you're thinking to yourself, this should matter, right? Like you should have some changes in heart rate if you have like a hypothesis going into that. Well, I'm gonna show you guys another approach to analyzing ECG data. So one of this is uh, called heart rate variability, or we're looking at the variation in heartbeat frequency over time. So I have here two plots. So the green plot I showed uh, everyone before, and then the, you know, the other plot on top is another one. Here, we actually have the same heart rate. So if you count this interval, there are five beats. What we're gonna see here is the top plot has higher uh, heart rate variability, and the bottom plot has lower heart rate variability. So there are little differences between the successive beats, or between the interbeat interval there. So that's the time that I've marked on the plot. So when we're looking at heart rate variability, what we're doing is we're trying to look at the emotional states that heart rate, heart rate variability represents. So when you're looking at this, it's actually kind of an intuitive flip compared to heart rate, where in this scenario, if you have a higher heart rate variability, it tends to show that you're more physically fit, you're more emotionally resilient, so you're not gonna even, uh, you know, be as, as bothered by that that big drop. Uh, and interestingly enough, this metric has been used quite a lot for drowsiness as an indicator of drowsiness, especially during research on whether or not someone's drowsy at the, at the wheel. Um, the one thing that we tend to look at for HRV is actually to look at when it's lower, right? So again, AB contrast, when it's lower, you're actually more stressed out, anxious, uh, greater emotional arousal. One thing to keep in mind is that HRV is uh, not an event-related metric, so unlike heart rate. In this case, it's often used as a global state to characterize an individual. So that means that HRV will tend to take a little bit of time to kind of uh, show up in the, in the analysis. So to measure something like this, you need at least two to five minutes of data. And as I mentioned in the prior slide, that you need a recording rate of about 512 hertz or higher in order to get that resolution for your data to make this analysis. HRV can be used as a measure of physiological stress, arousal, cognitive expenditure, but you have to keep in mind, and as mentioned before, 
heart rate is already controlled by a lot of different factors. You can't control yourself, which also means heart rate variability will come highly dynamic and individualistic. So to make good judgment on what that metrics will give you, you really need uh, to take a lot of good care of your study design in order to make it work for you. I love that so you brought I, up this. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I love really? that you brought. I love that you brought up this point. Um, just because, you know, heart rate seems like such a simple thing, but so many things feed into it. It could be, yeah. you know, the time of day, how much caffeine you've had that day, whether you've had like a stressful trip to the office. Um, I think everyone's heart rate variability in the current state of the world is probably a little bit lower than baseline. <laughs> so, when it comes to study design, like, what are some typical um, controls that you might use um, when bringing people into the lab? Yeah, one of the things uh, is to actually have a baseline measure, right? So when I'm talking about A-B contrast, so in this case, we have a, you know, a desktop environment or a VR environment, you can actually also record a, a scenario where they're not really doing much. So it's just a baseline scenario. So there, then you can compa compare and contrast to that uh, baseline. So even if you came into the study at a, a certain baseline because of something that happened prior, then you can still be assured that everything is just being compared to that same baseline, right? The same state. Um, the other aspect is you just need to make sure that you have, you know, a great control of the variability or the covariates that might influence your, your, your data. So take care of your study design. And then the other aspects, measure some of these metrics so that you can later on do, you know, some good stats on your data to, to kind of, tease some of those effects out of that, that data that you get. Yeah, that makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, that would be a minority approach at, at taking care of that. So this, this result here for the roller coaster ride, uh, capturing that experience by our heart rate variability. So just overall, we actually see the exact same uh, style here but that's reflected of the heart rate measure. So if you recall, I say heart rate variability is actually kind of a flip intuition from heart rate. So in this case, lower heart rate indicates greater stress, greater emotional arousal. We see that uh, much more in the VR condition compared to the desktop condition. And there's a greater drop there when they are going through that big drop, that first drop, the one that you mentioned, Justin, would make you feel anxious. Um, so the conclusion here is that I do think VR in this scenario can bring uh, a great simulation of the visual experience as well as that physiological experience that you get. When you're riding a roller coaster, um, both event related and an overall kind of the global state related aspect, which is kind of cool, just like that scary game you did with Mellows. Yeah, I think it's so a couple points. So, like, I think it's so interesting that you can, with the same sensor, essentially, you can get two different angles on things. So, if we were to take driving, for example, um, mm -hmm. heart rate beats per minute being like more of an event-based measure, that would be really good for like looking at the acceleration in heart rate if like a car cuts you off in traffic, right? Yep, but exactly. as, as like a global measure with HRV, then you can look at more long-term states like drowsiness during a late exactly. night drive, right? So it's like yeah. same experience, same sensor, completely different aspects coming out of it depending on how you analyze it, um, which I think yeah. is really cool. Um, the second point is that uh, for everyone in the audience who is really interested in anxiety and HRV, because we both uh, have presented some very anxiety inducing examples, we also have another great webinar on capturing anxiety in VR that focuses more on GSR. Um, so I think Kate will post the link to that in the chat. But if you want to dive a little bit deeper into that, that webinar is amazing. Awesome. I actually really did like that webinar. So cool. Shall we move on to our? Next part is our chat topic. Yes, so I was super curious looking at those uh, schematics you had of electrode placement. This stuff can get pretty invasive, uh, I feel. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable having a bunch of electrodes underneath my shirt. And I know that in a lot of applications, um, particularly in the commercial space where we have to think about economy of time and um, you know the, the comfort of the participant, is there any way that we can record heart rate without using such invasive measures? Yeah, we actually, uh, we get that question all the time, right? And I think a lot of that also nowadays is even more uh, topical. You don't want to get in close proximity to put some of these sensors on um, participants, right? Well, I guess 
the first one is less so of an alternative um, tool in order to do so, but I would have to say alternative placements. So if you recall with the heart uh, and capturing that cardiac activity, you need to make a special triangle around the heart. In layman's term, you just need to put your electrode sensor to box around the heart. So if you can imagine if you keep it on the chest and you box that, that those sensors around the chest, you can actually start to move outward um, to then use your limbs. So in this case, on the left-hand side, you have an example of an alternative placement of the electrodes that capture heart rate the same way, um, but now with the wrist and the ankles. Um, you will definitely get a weaker QRS complex, uh, as I mentioned before, but you will still get a good enough resolution to look at heart rate. So, you know, when different QRS complexes occur, uh, but if you care about how strong that, that QRS complex is, then you might want to get closer to the chest, but if you don't care too much about it, you can actually move outward uh, from there. So besides the alternative placement, you actually have alternative tools, right? I think most everyone here might know what this is, uh, but they wouldn't know the terminology. So in this case, it's PPG. So what this sensor is doing is it's using light that is transmitted through your skin and the amount of light that bounces back is measured. And what this is doing is looking at volumetric changes in your blood vessel. So whether or not when you have your heartbeat, then there's always that push of blood through your system, your circulatory system. And this is actually captured by the wearables. Exactly, so there we have a Fitbit. And in the example that I have here is actually a Apple Watch. So much of the wearable devices that we have nowadays measure heart rate through PPG. And here you'll have an example of what a PPG signal is capturing. So on the top, I have an ECG signal where I have the two um, successive beats. And what you see is the PPG beat actually lies in between two successive beats because once the heart have the electrical propagation go through it and the heart pumps, then that blood starts to travel. So when you have that bump or that greater uh, volume through the blood vessels, then PPG is actually capturing that um, fluctuation in, in that volumetric change. So how does, does it work good? well? Can you do different analysis on it? And I will actually show you that Yes, you can. So in this uh, application, I have an interesting VR application. So it's another application where here we're using VR to create a, an environment, a simulated environment. And something like this can be really good for something like exposure therapy, right? So if you're a researcher that's trying to have your participants experience an environment in a safe space that you can just turn off right away and make sure it's controlled, then this would be a great way to look at the physiological response that your participants is having during that study. So this one, we have our colleague Amy here. And what she's doing is she's playing a game where she's going through a ruin. So there's an exploration phase. Once the exploration takes her is actually to a big room that has a bunch of spiders that comes out. And the way that this thing is queued up is that at a certain point, these spiders will actually start to be attracted to you and come towards you. So you can see if this is exposure therapy for like arachnophobia, this would be you know, truly something to put someone at a greater heightened arousal state for sure. So again, what we're doing here is we're actually having a comparative assessment of the different experience that Amy is having, uh, or in this case, actually Amy and a couple of other people in the study, where we're looking at the exploration phase, as well as the phase in which people are in that big room where the spiders come out. You'll see here, interestingly enough, using the PPG signal that we have here, now we're not collecting ECG, but PPG, we actually don't see a big difference in the heart rate um, during the exploration phase and the spider phase. But you imagine if you're wearing this, there, there should be some, some differences, right? Well, in terms of heart rate variability, looking at you know, a greater global state, we do see a difference. And in this case, we see that there was sort of greater anxiety, stress during the, the room, during the room with the big spiders and all the spiders coming out compared to exploration. And I know some of our colleagues that did this study did not totally like it too much, uh, but it's kind of cool to show in practice what this means to use both HR and HRV as ways to analyze your ECG data.
think we're all thr thrill seekers here at iMotions. We're all trying to scare each other in our, st <laughs> our in-house studies. <laughs> well, the next one, I don't think will be something with, with scare in it. That's true. Um, so how about alternative? So you mentioned that I, at iMotions, we like facial expression, right? Some of the facial expression tools that we have. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how EMG compares to optical facial expression analysis, so in this case, using webcam-based uh, algorithms? Yeah, I can definitely dig a bit more into that. So um, facial expression analysis takes many forms. There's the facial action coding system, which is your human hand-coded method that we're all familiar with. Um, facial EMG for a long time was a gold standard of looking at the physiology of facial activation. So looking at the underlying muscular activity. And because we're looking at underlying activity, it's actually in a sense more sensitive compared to webcam based measures like aftx or facet or realize or any of the other ones out there because you can get at when a muscle is barely active before the contraction of that is registered visibly on the webcam so the great thing is that there is a good chunk of correspondence between how we can think about facial emg and the musculature and what we see in aftex and specifically the facial action uh, units. So if we can recall from Affectiva, um, that and the facial action coding system are based off of action units. So these are specific individual movements of the face. The great thing though, is that these are typically one or two muscles. So brow furrow is corrugator, smile is zygomaticus. Um, so what I have here in this table is a list of popular action units that we see researchers um, interested in and the associated muscles that are responsible for generating those movements. So it is possible to take an action unit that you would define using affectiva, but then measure it using facial EMG to get that more sensitive metric. This figure here, which I've adapted um, from Boxtel in, in 2010, looks at common electrode placement for different muscles of the face um, and how you can correspond those to your different action units. So like I mentioned, uh, corrugator supercilii is popular for brow furrow. Zygomaticus is listed here in blue. Another really popular muscle is orbicularis oculi. So that's the yellow here. That is the muscle around the eyes that is responsible for that nice crinkling you get when you give a true smile. Um, I think it's Tyra Banks that called it smizing. So if you wanted to look at smizing behavior, orbicularis is a really great muscle for that. Um, of course, there's many other options here depending on what specific um, action unit or expression you want to look at. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is there is already a correspondence between the two. Um, so it is possible to reap the benefits of both without necessarily shifting your paradigm about how you can think about facial movements. I never realized, but this is a really cool cheat sheet for researchers that want to go between the two methodologies, right? It's yeah. kind of cool. Um, this paper came out recently, I think it was February of this year, which was really exciting, um, but Koke and colleagues basically wanted to correlate what we see in facial EMG to what comes out of Affectiva. So they looked at the um, mean facial EMG amplitude for zygomaticus and corrugator and correlated them um, to smile and brow furrow and even uh, the aftex measures for joy and anger, which are more general emotion scores. So across the board, there were significant correlations between um, all of these measures. It's really more of a validation pay, um, piece for affectiva because facial EMG is sort of the older gold standard in this case. Um, but just to show sort of the relation of these two to each other and they correlate quite well. That's, you love it when science validates. <laughs> So another quick example um, of a different application apart from VR is usability and human factors. And I wanna highlight Expedia's usability lab, especially. So Expedia has this big usability lab that they collect data on people using the Expedia website for arranging travel. Um, neutral website stimuli, we always talk about whether certain stimuli can be used with facial expressions. A travel website is fairly neutral, so it's doubtful you're gonna get the really strong valence reactions that you're going to want for good facial expression data. So in a website case like this, you're gonna need that kind of sensitivity that facial EMG can give you. So in this case, Expedia used Zygomaticus, that smile muscle, to try and quantify delight as people looked at different aspects of a travel page when booking a vacation. What they were able to do is build sort of 
a demo base, like a um, sort of a database of different demographic demographics and what they respond to when booking a vacation. So in this um, article by Focuswire, they mentioned a couple of interesting examples. Uh, French demographics, for example, really like a free breakfast and like to see photos of like opulent food. Um, millennials in general respond very well to large, well-appointed bathrooms. I know that's something that <laughs> is important to me when I travel, but you get all sorts of really interesting insights um, from using EMG with usability. Oh, man, I really need to read the source uh, to see what else is, is being looked at. Ooh. Okay, shall we move on to a little bit more technical talk, a little bit about that? We yes. just can't leave people here without some tech. Yeah. So, Jess, can you tell us a little bit about now that you have data, what do you do with it? And, you know, can, can we do that easily in iMotion? Yeah, so I will say straight up, EMG is not an easy sensor. The learning curve is particularly steep, and that's because there is a lot of signal processing that you have to do in order to get any usable insights from the signal. So I've listed some of the steps here, um, and it, it goes beyond the scope of the webinar to dive really deep into these. Of course, I'm happy to answer questions later on, but with a raw EMG signal like this image on the left, you have to basically filter to isolate particular frequencies, rectify, meaning taking the um, absolute amplitude of it. There's often smoothing that occurs to get the overall shape. And then if you really want to compare amplitude across conditions, there's a normalization phase to a max contraction. All of that is to say there's a lot of extra steps that have to be taken. It's not one of those push button, get results sort of sensors. Um, however, uh, iMotions is taking steps to make this easier for you. We do have in our notebook, in our analysis suite for EMG smoothing and normalization. Um, so quick screen cap here of what that looks like in the interface. Um, but what you're able to get is to take that raw signal from the EMG, um, filter, smooth, rectify it to see sort of when activation occurs. And then if you wanted to normalize to a max contraction, we do have also some, um, some fields to build that into uh, the R notebook as well. So if you actually click, there should be a video here. Yeah, so here's me using a phone and just measuring from the muscles of my thumb here. So you're able to see as I'm swiping, the brown is the raw activation, green is the filtered and smoothed activation, and then blue is normalized to a max contraction here. So you can see out of my max capability, exactly how much power am I exerting um, with the thumb. So I'm very excited to have that come out. My last application here is in communications. So within the communications field, um, there is a, a subset of, of researchers that very heavily employ um, physiological data, which is really exciting. This is a paper by Bulls, Potter, and Lang from 2001 looking at people's responses to uh, radio advertisements of a positive or negative valence. So again, measuring zygomaticus and corrugator here, they approached it a little bit differently, actually binning uh, the raw amplitude of the muscles over time. So what you're able to see here on the left is in response to a positive radio ad, you get an increase in zy zygomaticus activity. Whereas here on the left, in response to a negative radio ad, you get an increase in corrugator. So this makes a lot of sense. Um, but this basically illustrates how within communications, even when listening to something like radio, um, you're still able to have these sort of emotional responses that are visible and able to be picked up by physiological measures. That's so cool. So you don't really need to watch something, right? You can just still listen to it. Um, yeah. So the only technical aspect that I want to provide folks with before you know this this conversation ends is that try to keep your data clean, right? Keep it clean. Minimize the movement when you're collecting ECG signal to prevent sort of muscle noise. So I know we talked about EMG and how you can record muscle noise in ECG. You don't want to record muscle noise other than the heart. Um, you know, make sure you prep the electrode and placement sites well. When it comes to electro wires, keep it short. Keep it just the right amount of uh, distant length so that you don't introduce a noise from that cable, right? Noise like from, from the lights in this room. Uh, as well, always remember to have a controlled environment. So I can't be, you know, I can't stress this enough. HR or just in general heart rate is very sensitive to different em environmental factors that we can't control. But as researchers, you can definitely control what's happening in your study so that you can get a cleaner signal there. So I have a little bit of a couple of examples of what these common artifacts are that it looks like. So with you know sweating or not having a, a well enough prep site, you're gonna get some of these 
bigger drift uh, in the signal. So you see these waves. Um, if you have too long of cables or you have bad shielding, you can have these power line different interference, which is very, very quick signal. And then the muscle or EMG noise you can see here is introduced right there as sort of big spindles within the clear QRS complex that we normally see from, from heart rate. In general, I'll, I'm also kind of um, demonstrating that we also have an ECG heart rate variability uh, notebook analysis here. So for this type of analysis, we're only looking at the temporal aspect of heart rate variability, but we're also giving you the heart rate as well. So the calculation is essentially taking the raw signal, filtering that in order to figure out when each of the QRS complex happened, take those interbeat interval to do the heart rate variability analysis on top of that. So you'll get something like this. So this was actually the roller coaster study uh, with the participant sitting there and you, know, you have all these metrics with the raw metrics. Um, this is indicating when a successive heart, a successful heartbeat occurred. And then you'll see that heart rate at any moment and then a heart rate variability metric here that we also provide you as a collapsed uh, number in terms of an average across that. So you get a single metric there to compare between conditions. Um, and finally, actually, uh, another cool thing you can do, if you just want to use heart rate, you can also follow what both Father and Lang did here. Uh, you can bend the heart rate within different timing there and also look at comparative uh, cases between positive or negative ads in this case where negative ad elicited uh, you know, slower heart rate compared to positive ads. And you know, that's, that's all I had to say from the technical side, but I also have to give a shameless plug to our uh, iMotions blog because we have a ton of great um, uh, references there that people can, can refer to for ECG, for heart rate, for heart rate variability. We have a, it's a gold mine of information on there. Cool. So yeah, uh, so a quick wrap up again. Um, if you're interested in, in the usage of any of these sensors, uh, we're happy to answer questions on that. Um, and yeah, I think that's all the time we have. So I'll throw it back to Kate. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. We have some questions already queued up. Uh, so I'm going to pull the first one up. But while we're doing that, I would just love to hear if we can get in touch with you. Uh, so I'm just going to launch a quick poll to hear uh, if we can, yeah, talk to you about any of these solutions that we've talked about earlier. So um, let's give you guys a, a minute to fill that out. And while we're doing that, I'm going to ask the first question to Jess and Coy. So we actually got two questions about Polar watches and uh, Apple iWatches. So mm -hmm. would Polar or Apple uh, work with iMotions to collect HRV data, for example, compared to ECG with the shimmer? Um, and you mentioned PPG as an alternative. Is it the same data accuracy to use an Apple Watch to collect, collect heart rate and heart rate variability? Um, and can you even integrate with iMotions? Yeah, yeah, I guess the first Oh, sorry, Jess, go. Go, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, I guess the, the first thing I would say is for, for PPG measures uh, or metrics there, PPG is a lot more sensitive to movement. So if you're putting a watch on your, your, your wrist, uh, just know that compared to ECG, you're going to get a lot uh, noisier data if there's a lot of movement involved uh, there. Yeah, yes. and then regarding the question about hardware, so Polar watches and Apple watches we don't integrate with. Um, the two options right now that our full integrations are the Shimmer and the Biopack. Um, that's not to say that people haven't integrated Polar watches specifically before. I know I've seen that with a couple of clients through our API. So it is a little bit more of a, a tailor-made solution. I think also we are looking at the integration of low energy Bluetooth devices down the road. So that should expand our repertoire of the kinds of hardware that's available to synchronize. Yeah, so if, you, if you're using Polar devices, we do have a webinar that actually uh, touch base on that a little bit, our API webinar that demonstrates integrating the Polar device with iMotion. So if you need, if you have a need there, just reach out to us and, and we'll work with you there. Yes, definitely. And we're also uh, running a, a solicitation for proposals at this moment for our mobile research platform, where we're looking into other wearables um, to be used in a research context of uh, research outside of the lab in the wild. So if that's interesting to you, you can also head over to our platform page at imotions.com slash platform. And that'll bring you, there's a call to action at the bottom of the page where you can find uh, the proposal. Uh, so you can submit your proposal if you'd like. 
Um, cool, so let me just, uh, looks like the majority of you guys have answered, so I'm gonna close that poll, and I'm gonna ask the last couple questions. We still have some coming in, and we only have five minutes left, so I'm, I'm hoping we can fit them all in, but I have two questions um, here about uh, covariates that we should routinely be measuring for both EMG and ECG, um, and if you're actually using PPG for measurement, what kind of things do we have to regulate in terms of do subjects need to be sitting and standing still, and what else might affect the movement factor? As you yeah. want to go for the EMG first? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with with covariates, there, there's not many that you need to have, which is nice. Uh, and I think it really also depends on your use case. So in the movement and rehab space, we often looked at EMG and force at the same time, because force is actually the muscle output, and it's also less variable than EMG as a signal. So we like to have both at once. But majority of use cases, at least in communications and um, and usability, VR, you don't need that. Uh, one of the things though that I want to emphasize is if, if amplitude and being able to compare across different groups is a thing that you want to look at, I mentioned a normalization step earlier. So the rationale behind that is the amount of voltage you can generate from a muscle changes day to day within a person. It could change depending on the time of day, the amount of water you've had that day, how hot is it, um, and even the movement of the muscle underneath the skin and the fat over top can influence how the voltage is picked up by the electrode. So what's common practice, at least in rehab, is to normalize to a max contraction, meaning at the very beginning of your study, you do several trials where you contract that muscle as hard as possible. And when I was doing it with the arm flexors, we were yelling at people to like pull as hard as you can. Um, with that max contraction, that establishes a 100% activation, which you can then use to normalize across conditions. So that way, the voltage across people, which is variable, is now all on the same scale, at that of 100%. And that way you can, can you can compare between conditions, between groups, um, between different times of day as well. So that was my speedy answer. Yeah, and then with ECG, again, um, it's always good to have a baseline measure. Um, but with covariates that you need to consider is with the heart rate, it can be very influenced by even how many cups of coffee you've had. So you can always, depending on the day, time of day, record the time of the day that people are coming in. Did they just go to the gym right before coming to the study, the amount of sleep they had the night before? Uh, so anything that can be a stressful environment that can cause a disruption in overall uh, performance of the heart that you might be able to pick up during your, your study that might, you know, may or may not uh, add noise to, to your insights. Um, again, with the, the PPG device, with, with sort of all heart rate measures, you want to try to minimize motion as best as possible. Uh, during uh, periods of, of interest, right? During a task period. Um, mm -hmm. If you really have motion in there, a lot of devices have accelerometers. So you can try to use that to try to figure out when movement happened and you can use uh, statistics to try to, uh, you know, take out that, um, that noise from your data during the statistical analysis portion. Um, but, you know, reach out if you have specific questions or, or something. How you would do that. Yes, I was also going to mention that if you are an iMotions customer specifically, you have a customer success manager who can help you figure out um, how to reduce noise, figure out how to set up your study the best way possible. Um, and if you're not an iMotions customer, here's a plug for all of our awesome uh, customer success managers that if you become a client, then you have access to all of their knowledge and guidance. So it's a really great tool. Um, cool, we have two minutes left, so I'm gonna ask some other quick questions. So we have a question about how strong the stimuli itself need to be in order to get a, an ECG signal. Um, so if you're analyzing a change in emotion, for example, it is exposure to different uh, noise stimuli or any other type of stimuli, like how would you best collect that data in order to figure out how strong the stimuli needs to be? Yeah, and that, that question goes back to how uh, heart rate heart rate variability is so um, individualistic. It just really depends on your the environment you're collecting. Uh, mm -hmm. That's gonna be a variable question or response in my case. You can actually measure something very subtle uh, right, so in the case of uh, of, of a, a game like the, the 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 spider game, you can have someone who says they're not afraid of spiders, but if they go through that exploration, they might be scared of something like the dark. So the exploration actually might influence some of that. Uh, what I've done before is uh, you can play songs, and you can actually look at how songs influence people when they're watching marketing ads. Uh, and one of the things that 
was very curious to us and we we want to see we didn't know or realize about is sometimes you can have nostalgic song that touches people differently compared to others and you might actually have heart rate responses there so it's just certain things to consider but even this this more the subtlest thing can actually trigger um heart rate variability mm -hmm. yes great Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have. So if you do have other questions that we didn't get to, you are welcome to email us at marketing at emotions.com and I will distribute it to the experts we have seen today. So I just want to say thank you both so much for your time and thanks to all the participants and the people on the line who have listened in and for your great questions. And uh, we will be in touch if you've said that you would like us to reach out to you. So thank you again, both Jess and Koi, and uh, we will talk soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thanks, everyone. Folks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.